morning. It's wonderful to see so many people joining us today for the launch of our new publication, Olfaction, A Journey, which celebrates a decade of the IFRA UK Fragrance Forum. Today should have seen our 10th Fragrance Forum, which we were due to hold at the prestigious Royal Institution. Sadly, we were forced to delay it until October 2021, and we hope to welcome many of you to that event next year. In the meantime, we are all having to be more creative and think about organising events in different ways, which is why we are holding this virtual book launch today. When we started working on our anniversary book, looking back at the amazing speakers that had contributed to the forum over the last decade and the breadth and innovation in the work they had presented, we realised we were sitting on something very special. So that is why we decided to forge ahead and launch the book with what you might call a very mini version of the forum, bringing together some of the past speakers to hear about what they are up to now. We have got some exciting presentations for you, as well as an overview of what you can find in Olfaction A Journey from Lizzie Ostrom, who has been pivotal in editing the book and helping us theme it. We will be having a mixture of short films and live presentations, and we will be happy to take questions for speakers that are joining us live. Do use the chat function and let us have your questions as we go through the event, and we will return to them at the end. To get us underway, we are going to hear from Lizzie Ostrom, who most of you in the industry already know well. Lizzie is certainly one of the mo UK's most exciting commentators on all things scent. Lizzie has produced hundreds of events around the sense of smell, from psychology to science, arts and culture. She's the author of Perfume, A Century of Scents, and she co-curated the landmark exhibition at Somerset House, Perfume, A Sensory Journey Through Contemporary Scents. Lizzie has been supporting brands, production companies and artists in realising scent-based installations and we were delighted when she agreed to help us put together this new publication. So let's hear from her now, Lizzie Ostrom. Hello everyone, I am Lizzie Ostrom and I'm really pleased to be at this event. I edited the celebratory book with IFRI UK, which was quite the challenge, but such a privilege and an exciting project to work on. I remember thinking, how do you turn 10 years of an event that is diverse, rich, quite erudite into an accessible celebratory book? So essentially the book is trying to distill a decade of conference presentations. I think there have been something like 60 speakers over the years, many of whom have given really detailed, captivating talks. And some of them quite complex because they are researchers or chemists. And so what we were trying to do was to distill these presentations into digestible chunks so that you can dip in and out, peruse by theme, depending on what you're interested in. And also, I think, to really convey the individual voices of each speaker and try and bring them to the reader in a way that's very relatable and that hopefully brings across their personalities as well. And so the idea is that when you pick this up and you, you know, you look through it, you might read it cover to cover or you might sort of do a couple a day, that you do get a sense of these many, many voices some of whom are in the industry, some of whom are out. You know, we've got an Egyptologist in there, for example. And together, you get this beautiful chorus of new ideas, um, this real fizz and ferment of what's been going on in fragrance. So you might come across a chapter about how the sense of smell has a role in understanding Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's. You might have a chapter about urban planning and how olfaction plays into the way that our cities are developed. There are chapters on art and perfume, ancient history and perfume, and that ever exciting question in this industry about how exactly we do smell as human beings and how does that compare with animals. So I, found just every day 
editing a chapter and I'd be flicking from business insights in through to cognitive neuroscience. And it's quite a um, it's quite a journey. And I suppose that's why we called the book Olfaction a journey, because you are taken right through this industry. I'm quite sure that when you come to the end of this book, you will want to know more. You'll be hungry for more and you'll be excited to learn more about all the speakers and the brilliant work and research that they're doing. So I think you possibly will be taken down some very exciting rabbit holes to learn more about olfaction. I'm excited for the next 10 years in fragrance. Who knows what it will bring, but let's see where it takes us. A big thank you to Lizzie for the hard work she and her colleagues did in helping us bring together such a coherent and interesting read from the diverse range of areas we have covered over the last decade. Now it's time to hear from some of our other former speakers. In 2013, we heard from Professor Charles Spence, head of the Crossmodal Research Laboratory, Departmental of Experimental Psychology, University of Oxford. He talked about neuroscience-inspired multi-sensory design and how product perception can be affected by our senses. Then in 2016, we heard from Professor Barry C. Smith, Director, Institute of Philosophy, Center for the Study of Senses, who talked about the role of smell in consciousness and the difference between orthonasal and retronasal olfaction. I'm excited to tell you they now both come together to tell us more about their current research and to challenge us about how we imagine odours. Thank you, Lisa. It's good to be with you. So I'm Barry Smith and I'll do the first part of the presentation to you this morning. And then I'm followed by my colleague, Charles Spence. Let me start my slides if I can. So, Let's go to the first slide. Although smell matters a lot to people in the perfumes and colognes they wear, in the detergents and laundry products they choose, even in those smells of baking that we enjoy, people nonetheless think that they are only uh, using their sense of smell when they're sniffing or when they're pointing their nose at something to take in odors. It's not true that we only experience odors when we sniff. Although we think that that's when we, we are using olfaction, it's not true. We smell because we breathe. So all the time, volatile compounds in the environment are coming into the nose, activating the receptors. So smell is always on. And yet it's hard for people to believe that. They often don't notice smell between these incidents of sniffing a flower, a dish, a perfume. And the question is, what is going on in those gaps? Are there unattended smells? Or is it that smell just becomes unconscious? Are we in the situation where we know that we don't seem to smell our own homes? Funny because everybody else's home has got a distinctive smell when you walk in, but you no longer notice the smell in your own home. So is that due to the fact that you're habituating, that if something hasn't changed, if everything stays the same, you simply zone out? So if we're not noticing smells, apart from when we pay attention and we do some sniffing, how good are we in those moments? How acute is our sense of smell? Well, it turns out that people are not very good at estimating. You'll hear a lot of people saying, oh, I, my sense of smell is terrible. I can't smell anything uh, well at all. And yet, we can measure objectively using here uh, Thomas Hummel's sniffing sticks. We can judge people's threshold when they detect an odor. We can judge how well they can discriminate between odors and whether they can identify the odors they're smelling. And some people will tell you, I've got a very poor sense of smell and they will have a very high score on the T -T, uh, uh, TDI, uh, the objective measure. Other people will say, I'm very interested in smell and bothered by smells a lot. And it turns out their, their discrimination and even their thresholds are, are really quite poor. So there's a mismatch between awareness of your olfactory capacities and your accuracy. So given that people are not that good at reporting on their sense of smell, 
And given that there's lots of occasions where they don't notice a sense of smell, how are we to get at their conscious experience of smell? Not just how they behave and how they perform in these objective tests, but what's the quality of their experience like? What's actually, what's it like to smell these lemons? Well, there are other ways we can explore olfaction. Of course, we can look inside the brain and see what happens. And we know, of course, whether the odor molecules are reaching the, the olfactory epithelium at the, at the uh, bridge of the nose uh, in the olfactory cleft. We know that it can either happen by molecules coming from the outside air as we sniff or from molecules reaching the same receptor sheet when they travel from the, the mouth up to the nose. We also know, next slide please, that these areas uh, that are projected to from the olfactory bulb, the first place that the uh, information from the receptors reaches, it's then projected to critical sites in the brain like the amygdala and the entorhinal cortex. And these are associated with arousal, emotion, but also memory for place. And part of those connections between smell and memory and place maybe a reason why we can sometimes experience something well documented by this man Marcel Proust the way in which the mere whiff of an odor can trigger a memory usually a highly emotional memory that we didn't even know we had that was there from childhood the smell of your grandmother's kitchen uh, a holiday many many years ago and it's also a reason why we can attach a great deal of emotional comfort to the places that we go to that we're familiar with. We love the smell of particular galleries that we visit. We love the way in which uh, this makes us feel at home and familiar. Although we may have these emotional connections to scent, it's very difficult to describe the scents themselves. Not only for ordinary folk when they're presented with a scent and, and asked, what do you get? What do you notice? But even for professional perfumers, how are they to find a language in which to communicate sent to others? It seems as though language lets us down and we're not very good at putting uh, the sense we experience into words. But maybe there's another way to get at our conscious experience of odor. Maybe there's a way in which we can draw it to our own attention and then we can reflect on that by imagining odors. Is this a way to explore the conscious experience of smell? without necessarily having to use words. So we're going to explore with all of you the extent to which you have olfactory imagery. Is it as easy for you to conjure up in your mind a familiar smell as it is to think of the face of a friend or to have a tune running through your head? Do you have that kind of olfactory imagery? So we're going to run a little poll now uh, and ask you some questions and we'd be very grateful if you would respond to the poll, and then we can reflect on that when we move to the talk by Charles. First question, please. So I don't see it on my screen, but let's see if I can just uh, suggest to you what we want to ask you. So we want to really ask, is it easy for you to imagine any of the following odors and, and a yes or no would be good if you would indicate that. Can you imagine now the smell of freshly cut grass? Yes or no? Can you imagine the smell of Chanel number no. five? Yes or no? Can you imagine the smell of heliotropin? Yes or no? Well, thank you if you've been responding to those questions. Uh, I'd now like to go to the second question. So when we're imagining odors, if you can imagine the smell of cut grass, say, is it just like the experience of smelling cut grass, maybe a little fainter? Or is it for you more like just having a thought about that odor? So again, we invite you to say whether it's more like smelling the odor or more like merely thinking about the odor. So is it thinking or is it 
more like a faint copy of the experience of smelling when you imagine the smell of cut grass. Some people are saying thought I can see in the chat and that's very interesting. So you are either industry professionals or very interested in olfaction and I'm amazed at how many practicing perfumers report that they don't have odors coming to mind. They might have thought about them, memory of them. They might even have a formula. So there's a great deal of variation in how we experience odors in our imagination, probably in our perception and memory. And then final question. For those of you who can imagine these odors, heliotropin, say, um, cut grass, when you imagine them, do you have other associated images? Do you have images of colors or sounds? Or do you think of a particular scene that you can visualize? So I'd really like to know if you have associated imagery, yes or no. And while you're responding to that, I think, unless we have all of the results in front of us, I think we now move to, ah, great. Some people say pictures and precise color patches. Excellent. So this is important, I think, uh, for the next uh, part of the discussion, and I'm going to hand over to Charles to talk about that. Charles. <laughs> Well, good morning, um, and can I have my first slide, please? There we go. So uh, I'd like to follow up on the theme started by Barry about imagining uh, odours, thinking about communicating uh, odours. Uh, and in particular, this is an area we've been uh, looking at a lot recently, uh, kind, of the, kind of the notion of whether you can communicate uh, scent, fragrance, uh, without using words. And in particular, whether it's possible to communicate fragrance through color, but also through shape, sounds, textures, and so on. Today, I want to focus primarily just on the question of communicating fragrance without words, uh, without language, but uh, by means of color. And this is the topic of a, a paper that should be out any day now, kind of a review of what I'm calling olfactory color uh, cross-modal correspondences and how they're used in, in science, uh, of which I'd count psychology, um, art uh, and design as well. Now this interest of, of the colors that we associate with, that we bring to mind when imagining an odor has been one that has in fact been of interest to writers and commentators and scientists for uh, a rather long time. We can sort of see the, the situation here. We've got three uh, perfumes where a particular color is kind of uh, pretty dominant, the purple for manifesto. Uh, and it seems to me an open question as to whether that color correctly conveys something about the scent, especially important in the COVID era when many, many more of our purchases are done online. And in the absence of the ability to smell the thing we're thinking about buying, can I communicate to you uh, uh, using colour, and does it matter what colour I pick? Are there meaningful connections between uh, scent and fragrance uh, and colour, both hues and saturation, intensity, um, and so on? Two other examples there, blue uh, by Chanel, blue by Chanel, and uh, Hugo Red. Uh, and one, once, one, once one looks over the internet at the full range of uh, fine fragrances, it's sort of clear how often um, colors are used to connote the product, the brand, or the, something about the fragrance. Now, when people start thinking about you know, colors that have you know, fragrances that, that evoke colors, or vice versa, uh, um, uh, fra uh, 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 fragrances that are by, by colors, or colors that are evoked by uh, fragrances, then the, the natural place to start is to say, this sounds all a bit like synesthesia. Synesthetes, those strange people who seem to uh, uh, maybe they're not strange people, but those people who strangely seem to connect their senses in unusual ways, who see colors for days of the week or units of time. Um, and maybe this, you know, smelling color, uh, that sounds like a synesthetic kind of thing to do. And indeed, going back over the literature, one finds uh, many people talking in those lines, if colors are to be associated with scent, 
then it must be a matter of synesthesia. And who better then to inform us about the right kinds of colours for sense than a synesthete with this kind of idiosyncratic connection? Ask them and then use their insight uh, to inform the rest of us, to convey something about uh, sense qualities without language. Um, but I think that's probably not the right way to go. Um, certainly there are synesthetes who may experience colours in response to sense, but they are rare. And what's more, uh, most kinds of synesthesia tends to be unidirectional. If a colour induces a scent, you won't find that the scent can also induce the colour. So it's a unidirectional phenomena, which feels unlike uh, what it's like for the rest of us to be able to communicate colour through for, uh, form uh, and scent and vice versa. Also, the synesthete, yeah, by definition, is kind of idiosyncratic, meaning that the colours that are invoked by one synesthete in response to smell will be different from those of others. By contrast, I think the notion of correspondences is a much more fruitful framework uh, to work with because these are bi-directional connections between our senses. They're also surprising, uh, but I think they can help to explain the mappings that we do share between scent and colour. Next slide, please. Um, and this is the literature on this very question. Once we've separated synesthesia uh, uh, from the topic of scented colors, here's one that is in uh, my recent review. And here, hard to see the details, but certainly each line in this table, a separate study from the very first from von Hornbostel back in 1931, presenting people with as many as 800 odors and trying to see whether they picked a particular lightness on a grayscale uh, in response. The answer was yes. From there, we have uh, De Ribere in 1978, a perfumer, um, who has a number of papers with a thousand people asking them for the colors associated with odors. And so it goes on mostly from the psychological scientists. Uh, we have studies done in many different countries over those decades from Germany to um, Canada to Australia. Um, mostly with weird participants, those Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic boys and girls studying psychology. But nevertheless, uh, across those more than 20 published studies now, it does appear that people do, even non-synesthetes systematically match colors to um, odors. Next slide, uh, please. So I think there's a, 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 a lot of research to build on here and to use and to, to help us to communicate uh, odor, fragrance, qualities uh, uh, through uh, colors, and perhaps also forms, and so on. I think it's important to say this is not uh, synesthesia, but then the question becomes, how do we do it? How do we match? What happens when I give you a fragrance or ask you to imagine a fragrance like the heliotropin that um, uh, Barry was mentioning a moment ago? How do you pick a color? What comes to mind and how? And maybe the most obvious way is if you smell something, you say that smells like a strawberry, and uh, well, strawberries are red, therefore the color that goes with that smell is of strawberries is red. So it's kind of a sourced based mapping. Just like when I, 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 I hear the dog bark, I, I bring to mind a visual image of a little small hairy thing biting my ankles. Um, so that could be the way in which colors are mapped to uh, odors. But the problem is for most of us, for most of the time when we are exposed to fragrance in the absence of any other contextual information, uh, we struggle to put a name to the source of that odor. I know it's familiar, I know I like it, I know I'd probably eat it, but exactly what is it? Uh, that is what struggle people struggle to name. And if we can't name the source object for an odor, that's gonna be even harder in the case of fine fragrance for many uh, regular consumers, then how then can we pick color? Uh, I think the uh, answer here is probably that um, we use emotion, and that seems to be what comes out of many of those studies I just showed you, that we attach emotion, uh, however emotion is to be defined, uh, to olfactory stimuli, and then we pick colours that share the same emotional connotation. And this idea of an emotional mapping between uh, colour and fragrance is one that one also finds when you try and think about or study why people match specific music, pieces of music to paintings and so on. So emotional based mappings. And those emotional based mappings uh, aren't maybe perhaps then as consistent or consensual as a mapping based on, a, on, a, on an object or a source object like a strawberry. And hence when you review those 20 plus studies, as I mentioned, 
one finds that while there are consistent mappings of color to experienced fragrance or described fragrance, nevertheless, even in the best case scenario, it's rare that more than 60% of your participants will pick a, the same specific uh, hue. Of course, that depends a bit on, 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 on quite how you run the experiment. Um, so in that case, if a single color is insufficient to convey a, a fragrance, can we get further by thinking about combinations of colors? And next slide, uh, please. Um, and that's really where I think sort of the world of design perhaps comes together increasingly with the world of the psychological science and the cross-modal correspondences research. I just want to sort of highlight three studies that were sort of interesting for me, thinking about using combinations of sensory cues, combinations of colors in this case, from work from uh, Schifferstein and Howell from 2015, where they took five um, well-known fragrances, uh, DKNY, Miss Dior, Kuros, Wish, and so on. Uh, and then uh, worked to create combinations of colors for perhaps the packaging as we see here that match the fragrance uh, that go beyond just a single color, but involve combinations of colors. Perhaps in, you know, there's a larger color patch there. We've got sort of a smaller one, an even smaller one where the number appears. And they were, they were able to show that these fine fragrances could be communicated more effectively without language, but through a combination of color. One other example we have here from Heatherly and colleagues from 2019, uh, this looking at wine labels, how to communicate the bouquet of a wine. Uh, and they're creating different colored labels for wines that have been doctored with uh, various compounds uh, to see which color, but also which shape. On the top line, we have wavy lines. On the bottom labels, we have more angular lines. So which combination of color and form or shape best convey specific wine uh, attributes. And again, they found that there were systematic correspondences, even in all of us who are not synesthetes, that certain colors did match uh, certain uh, olfactory notes. Next slide, please. And in one of our own studies um, uh, conducted in France, we've been also working in the same space, looking from a cross-cultural perspective now, giving people a range of familiar odorants, everything from caramel, uh, to lavender, uh, to mint, giving them the um, score sheet you see here with 34 color patches um, and asking them to pick the best, sometimes the worst colors to evoke that uh, fragrance. And then in the next slide, what we find is much cross-cultural similarity, but also uh, some degree of cross-cultural difference. And through the process uh, developed by my colleagues, uh, Marie and Jacquois, uh, we have the color cards for lavender on the left, for peppermint in the middle, and cucumber on the right. That, as you can see, uh, combine several different colors, but hopefully allow us to speak um, in a cross-cultural setting about a particular fragrance by using a combination of colors that will speak uh, to you, no matter what your language might be. I think there's a lot more to go on here. Um, in this world of using combined colors to communicate fragrance without language. But I would say at the end, I'm sort of currently struggling with the fact that while two colors or three colors might be better than one color to communicate uh, a fragrance, uh, as soon as you start combining colors, one runs into the problem that our, our response may be to how the colors harmonize with one another. And it's kind of this intrasensory grouping of colors starts to become the important thing rather than how each individual color communicates with the fragrance. So the question of intro, if you will, perpetual grouping becoming dominant over this cross-modal mapping of scent and color. I'm not quite sure how we address that issue yet, but it is one that I think is uh, important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harry and Charles. It's always a pleasure to benefit from your expertise. That really was fascinating. And you have given us plenty of food for thought there. Now it is time to hear from our fourth speaker of the day, Dr. Claire Guest. Claire has been involved in the training of dogs in the detection of human disease through scent for over 20 years. In 2003, Claire was training director for the first program in the world to train dogs in the identification of cancer by odour. 
In 2017, we were lucky enough to hear from Claire in her current role as Chief Executive and Director of Operations for the charity Medical Detection Dogs, an organization that trains dogs to identify human odor human disease by odour. They're currently working on a number of pioneering research projects, including the training of dogs to detect cancer, blood sugar changes, Addison's disease, and now COVID-19. Coincidentally, and unknown to us, Claire was also working on a project looking at sniffing out malaria with another of our 2017 forum speakers, Professor James Logan from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And in fact, they are now working together on the COVID-19 trials. And although she was unable to join us today, she has recorded a short presentation updating us on her work. And perhaps you will catch a glimpse of some of our canine friends helping her with her talk. Claire Guest. I'm delighted for this opportunity to give you an update about the work of medical detection dogs because I spoke to you um, a couple of years ago and we had a number of projects that were ongoing. So things have really moved on and we talked before about the evidence base for the canine effect on human health being a really quite recent thing. So only in the 1980s, the first studies started to be published about the firstly indirect effect and then the direct effect of um, pets, particularly dogs, on, on human health. And it's really only since the noughties that we've been looking at how they might be able to help health management and diagnosis. Now, we've been going since 2008, and um, our work has really developed from early cancer detection work with a publication that I was involved in, in um, published in the British Medical Journal in 2004, but since that time, we've discovered that dogs are able to, with their incredible sense of smell, detect a number of diseases very reliably. Now, why should a dog be so good? Well, as we know, a dog has 350 million sensory receptors. Us humans have 5 million, although I'm sure some of you out there will have an incredibly good sense of smell. They have a larger part of their brain dedicated to olfaction, and therefore they are biosensors with fluffy coats and waggy tails and this has meant that over the last few years not only have we been able to train dogs to detect the odor of diseases but we've been able to measure how reliable they are for particular conditions so we now know when we have a particular disease or medical condition this causes a metabolic change in our body and these metabolic changes lead to changes in our odor so we emit different volatile organic compounds depending on what disease we have now we can train dogs to detect these specific odors at very low concentrations and First, I'm going to talk about our biodetection project. Now, this is where we're training dogs to detect the odour of disease from samples that have been collected from an individual. And the dog is then trained in a, in a working environment. So the dog never has direct contact with, with the patient. Now, this is the list of the, the number of diseases we're currently working on, and it, it's growing all the time. But one of the um, diseases I know that you'd be particularly interested in because we discussed it um, a, a previous um, lecture is how our malaria work went. Now, this was in conjunction with Professor James Logan at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And a hypothesis was that dogs might be able to smell individuals who have been infected with the malaria parasite. I'm going to run a video now just to explain how this work was started and, and, and what this work in fact led to. So some years ago I visited the States and arrived at an airport and was astounded to see a sniffer dog looking for fruit and vegetable. So I thought, well, if a dog can smell fruit and vegetables, what about could they smell people infected with malaria? We know from some of our previous studies that when you have malaria parasites, your odour changes. So the parasites somehow manage to manipulate the body to, to change our body odour. And we know that because we've seen that with mosquitoes. So we know that mosquitoes can be more attracted to people when they have malaria parasites than uninfected 
uh, people. And that's all to do with chemicals being produced by our body that mosquitoes can detect. So we thought that perhaps dogs might be able to detect the same chemicals. The way that we collected the odours from children was to use nylon stockings. Um, now, nylon stockings are actually very good as a matrix to collect volatile chemicals. They hold on to the chemicals really, really well and they last for a very long time as well. So we actually got the children to wear these nylon stockings overnight and then collected the socks the next day and, and put them in the freezer, shipped them to the UK and then shipped them to medical detection dogs so that they could then train the dog uh, on the sample. So it's incredible to think that these dogs can detect the malaria parasite infection by sniffing just a little bit of a sock that an infected child has worn. So increasingly attention now is on elimination of malaria and so some countries are now malaria free or close to malaria elimination and it's really important for those countries that they prevent resurgence of malaria so therefore it's very important to detect people that are carrying malaria parasites so what we're thinking about is that these dogs could be used at ports of entry for identifying people that come into countries either from an airport or seaport or road port so the results of our study indicated that dogs were able to reliably detect individuals who had were carrying the malaria parasite, but were actually asymptomatic, so before they actually developed symptoms. Now, the dogs were able to do this over 90% accuracy, and this is well above what the World Health Organization require for a diagnostic. So the dog doesn't just tell you whether the disease is present, but they can also tell you, for example, how, how, how badly infected the person is or how like other individuals this particular uh, smell of disease is. I'm just going to show you this video, and the video quite clearly shows what the dog is able to do. Now, this dog is working uh, on a sample of uh, Parkinson's disease, and the Parkinson's is in position three. Now, you note that the dog interacts with the stand using a lot more pressure when he comes across this Parkinson's sample. And actually, this amount of pressure indicates to us that the dog is saying this is a very, very strong example of it. Now we're able to convert this to um, a printout uh, uh, and we're able to see quite clearly that in the green position, the Parkinson's position, the dog was making a, showing a clear difference. Now, of course, this becomes particularly interesting when you're dealing with a disease where diagnostics are particularly difficult. Now in that line, there was no Parkinson's at all. And as you see quite clearly, the amount of pressure and time the dog spent investigating the sample or identical. So this is really a hugely interesting way forward. So how can this information help us? Well, this is Florian, our best prostate cancer detection dog, visiting Dr. Andreas Mershon, MIT. Now, Andreas Mershon has developed a bioelectronic nose, and that's what, what Florian's actually sniffing. But he needs help to teach this nose what cancer smells like. And this is going to be done using an interactive system and building algorithms. So this is really the future. I'm sure many of you will have heard in the media that we're now um, starting a project to train COVID-19 detection dogs. Now we have good reason to believe this is going to be very, very possible because we've already trained dogs to reliably detect specific bacteria and, and, and viruses. So this is some recent um, media footage of our, the COVID dogs um, working on the project. And um, this is very, very exciting, but we're desperately requiring more samples at the moment to make sure that we can get some good data to prove whether or not dogs can smell this reliably. Just before I go, I just want to remind everyone that we still continue to train client partnerships. Now, these are dogs that are one-on-one -on -one basis, and they're broken up into a num number of different conditions. We train dogs to detect human blood sugar, drop attacks, adrenal uh, insufficiency in Addison's disease. What difference can these dogs make? Well, of course, they are absolutely fantastic, not only in warning minute by minute when required of an oncoming medical emergency, but they're already also able to alert at night when other technology may not work. We now have a number of other conditions that we discovered dogs can alert to very reliably. One of them is POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And this is when many people, often young people, suddenly drop to the floor with no warning at all. We found that dogs are able to give 
a three to five minute warning. And this transforms the lives of these individuals. Tell us what Henry does to help you. So I have a condition called POTS. Um, it basically makes me black out any time of the day. Basically when I'm upright, my heart rate increases and my blood pressure drops and I drop basically. So Henry will alert me to impending blackouts or palpitations, dizziness or semi blackouts. So he'll jump up at me and I can sit down in a safe place and it's all quite relaxed and chilled rather than dropping to the floor and hurting myself. How, how does he know? So I um, had to take uh, breath and sweat samples when I met him and obviously there's a change in my breath or my sweat and he can alert up to about five, seven minutes and that's plenty of time for me to sit down in a safe place. How do you feel about Henry and how much he's changed your life? Oh, he's, I, he's my little wet nose knight in shining armour. He really is. He's like a little ray of sunshine. Before him, it was, it, I had no independence. I felt super lonely. I felt anxious all the time. I couldn't leave the house without someone babysitting me. I just, I felt like my life was on pause almost. Um, I saw my friends growing up to be adults and um, moving out, getting fiancés you know, being adults and I just felt like a child still. So when he came into my life, I pressed play on my life again and it's allowed me to go back to education. It's allowed me to have a life rather than just sitting at home being scared, basically. Over the last 12 or more years, medical detection dogs has changed from what must have seen a very quirky idea to something with a robust evidence base. The detection of human disease through volatiles will save millions of lives in the future. We're delighted to have a royal patron and to have demonstrated our work last year to Her Majesty the Queen. I believe that this work will make a huge difference to our understanding of diseases in the future. Thank you. That is just amazing. And we really are grateful to Claire for sharing that with us. It is so wonderful to see the impact these dogs have on people's lives and the amazing strength of their olfactory sense. And now it comes to our final speaker of today and someone who probably needs no introduction to many of you. We're delighted to be joined by master perfumer, Christoph Laudemiel, who is kindly joining this event at a very early hour, live from New York. As a master perfumer, he has created fragrances for leading fashion and beauty houses around the world. He is president of Dream Air in New York and chief perfumer at Bel Air Laboratories, part of Loto Pharmaceuticals in Tokyo. He is known for his avant-garde work, establishing a trail of signature high-end and surprising fragrances used in a range of settings such as galleries, exhibitions and e gaming Christoph spoke at our Fragrance Forum back in 2011 and again in 2014. Today, he is going to update us on some of the exciting projects on the future of fragrance, which I'm sure is something we are all very interested in. Christoph. Um, so, um, I think we should play the the first uh, video. たまにはこのでいくか。ちょっと動かないが、タイルさんかなりついてる。わあ、さあ、連覇決定。死ぬ。死ぬ。死ぬ。死ぬ。死ぬ。死ぬ。死ぬ。死ぬ。死ぬ
And she's explaining that now we have a Bel Air lab that creates smells for different types of applications. And she starts by saying, hmm, it smells good in the air. And there is green or green. You will see it appears on the screen, which is one of the smells we've played um, to um, uh, remove some anxiety from people. And also we had uh, close to the presenters for the audience, uh, a scent called um, a Silver Shine, which was more complex, but it was to have the game feel more co like cool, a cool atmosphere. And they say to improve intelligence, so more to improve uh, brain activity. Uh, so I, sh I want to show you this little cartoon because it's so cute and it's we never see that in fragrances. And for me, that's the future. <laughs>レディオスタイルディエアリバイロトロ。レディアラボの調香師クリストフロダメールさんが石鹸のイースポーツ大会をイメージしたカオリを作ってくださいました。予選会場には会場の緊張感を和らげ、選手の集中をサポートするイメージ
to 30 cents. So you have a whole system of valves and, and dispatchers and everything here. Um, dispatches that to 24 people. And so we had six of those installed. Each seat was equipped with a scent microphone. These were actually helicopter microphones that we we uh, transformed into scent microphone with a, a tube coming into it. And so the scents could be played very, very fast. Next slide. You will see just the audience. That was at the Google and I'm in uh, Bilbao. Voila, so that's how it was. And then next slide. Now we've been continuing the research. Uh, so now it's with, uh, so in 2009, it was actually with Flatwoods, the largest ventilation company in the world based in uh, the UK and, uh, and in Sweden. And now here, this device on the left is, uh, was created two years ago with uh, some scientists at New York University and Columbia University to see how we could uh, make the smell uh, come to your nose and in a much more precise way and without um in a more pragmatic way and ultimately to go into a vr system for instance or into certain practices so the next slide i show you the patent application that just got filed i mean got filed a year ago and got published in this june 2020 same you don't have to read but you see the name uh, some of you will know the names of uh, dmitri reinberg and uh, actually his wife is uh, one of the engineers and then uh, Stuart feistin the other scientist and we've developed now this device that you could hold on your head and place the sand extremely precisely uh, just the quantity you need to evoke the imagery you want to evoke in your nose and uh, precisely to half a second a third of a second but more, more precise than one second. And then you can vary also the intensity. So, uh, but I cannot say much more at the moment. I don't show the picture at the moment, but this is going to uh, um, influence the future and in many, many different types of uh, applications, not just entertainment. Next slide. So talking about science, so this we're talking now about very high level science. So another group that you should hear about and hopefully you have heard about is the GCCR group. I know Barry and I think uh, Charles is also a member. So we've been uh, you, um, working actively on understanding more the, as we know now very well, the loss of smell and taste and also particularity of this study, uh, loss of the uh, trigeminal sensations among COVID patients. And uh, so I don't know if everyone knows, but loss of smell is the number one symptom of COVID more than temperature and uh, coughing. Huh? So when I have people in, coming in my office, they have to take the temperature gun, take a measurement, but also ask them right away if they were able to smell this morning or if they can smell something here. Uh, so people should know that. So here I'm also an author in that and with Barry and etc. So that paper, we have another one uh, coming up. So now one thing I want to mention about this uh, uh, pandemic is that for the sense of smell, it gave a big, big boost to olfactory research. It's amazing the amount of papers in six months that, come, came, uh, that came out and still coming out about the understanding. And I don't want to say thanks, but because of the virus, uh, a lot of budgets, a lot of teams, international teams here from 52 countries are working on a sense of smell to understand the virus, but be, to understand the virus, we have to understand the olfactory cells. So this is, this is really a, a big uh, consequence of this pandemic for us. Uh, and then another thing that's going to uh, impact also how we design this time fragrances is uh, an article that has been uh, accepted in Nature magazine, uh, from um, uh, Weizmann University and uh, in Israel. And uh, this is an article showing how we uh, can start to define some monomer, if you wish, of smell. So this is quite complicated and how maybe we can recreate with some unexpected monomer a known smell. So uh, it's the beginning of uh, long development. It touches for me in what Charles was explaining that uh, you almost always need several colors. And me, I always explain that I don't know one ingredient, even one molecule that doesn't smell of several things. It is totally different from color where you can take one red, one blue, one even one green, if green is a mixture, but we can have some kind of a unique colors if you wish. That's why you can do the printer uh, system. But in smell, if you take even c 3 xenol that people say it's cut grass, it smells of many different facets from petrol to yes grass to freesias to dirt and you, and et cetera, et cetera. 
So uh, it's going to be a complex, a complex system because we don't have the one order that smell of one thing because it would hang up in the air as a, that's my theory, as a chemical group without the rest of the molecule. <laughs> so it's, a, it, but I think that paper, well, that's why it was accepted in nature. So that's going to impact some uh, development, but also how we uh, develop things and AI is going to be very interested in this to, sim to try <laughs> to simplify. We are nowhere near that. So next slide. So this was, so we can discuss that another time. There was to mention about AI, how it's going to impact, but I think some other uh, conferences um, uh, will mention that, but uh, that was to show the complexity of things that AI is nowhere near reaching, but AI will be a tool um, for, can, can be a tool, but I would say no more, no less than music. Actually, music is much easier to, um, um, to modelize much, 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 much easier, and we are nowhere near having AI creating new songs. It can, it's possible, but we know that it's missing some things. And so in perfumery, uh, voila. but I think it will give some tools to create a certain way or to create quickly for certain immediate things. This I could see very well. Uh, next slide. So that was also about, uh, uh, so next slide, let's pass on this. That's what I call the moving piano. Uh, one thing I want to mention for the future is the definition. I think the definition of fine fragrance is going to change very much. There is no reason we should stop saying fine fragrance is alcoholic perfumery and technical or consumer goods or whatever perfumery uh, another kind. Um, we should define the style of perfumery we do for this product. Uh, this is shampoo for hotels. You see, they put my name, the name of the perfumer, but more and more that evolves. There are also some commercial shampoos in Germany, for instance, the Gül brand, where the fragrances are complex or elaborated. Huh? It's not just a very clean, fresh uh, or apple. And uh, so it's going to blur, I think, the definition between these things and the use of ingredients. It's going to be a lot more work for IFRA. Next slide. We also know some alcohol differences that are very technical, by the way. So here, the work of perfumers are becoming also much more uh, integrating the learnings from the winemakers. So I find the winemakers is very basic because they only use grapes. So now they have, they have developed that to an extreme. Uh, but we could do the same with cardamom and develop a whole industry around cardamom, a whole industry about uh, oranges, etc. Bon, it would be a nightmare for us. But here in brands like this, Strange Love, we integrate ingredients that are not in the perfumery catalog. We know now a whole uh, industry of tiny niche brands where they use ingredients. I don't even know where they find them. Some they love old ingredients. Some they love ingredients that as so Ifra has never reviewed them at all. And so, but this is going to be more and more. You can do all the rules that you want. First of all, there are countries that will want to have their own ingredients, like India and Brazil. They are very quiet, I, th I think, on the uh, fragrance market or the fragrance activity, but they're going to wake up and there's no way they're going to say, oh no, we are going to use only the ingredients that have been reviewed so far. So it's like in the kitchen where we had a, a period, I would say in the 70s, the 80s, with the fast food and other style of cuisine where, uh, the ingredients were not expanding, and all of a sudden, in the year 2000, every chef wants to have all the little seaweed and little things they found in their forest in Denmark and in their forest here and in their forest in Alaska. It's going to be the same in perfumery, and it has started. So here, I use ingredients that I source from smaller uh, suppliers or from uh, geographies. I mentioned Brazil, but also Australia. I don't know why. In the past three years, I have so many Australian projects, totally independent. And uh, I've been using more Australian uh, ingredients by my own will or some projects, they require that. So be ready to have some projects like I'm thinking specifically uh, India, uh, like unconventional things from India and Brazil, uh, Brazil, Peru, Bolivia, these countries. Uh, since we are in the UK, uh, well, maybe you know, but the Kew Gardens, they have about 8 million plants reference in the Kew Gardens in London. They received every year 30,000 new plants. The French industry, since I joined, have been extracting 200 to 300 ingredients. It's tiny, and most of them coming from uh, grass, the Mediterranean, so historical stuff, and then the colonies. Huh? So we have some ingredients from India, some from Africa, but then 
from uh, Brazil, very, very few. We have ginger, the ones that we know from other places, orange, ginger, uh, red, um, uh, red berries. This is going to explode. There's no reason that in those millions of plants, there are not many, many more that we can use safely in perfumery. Madagascar is looking at new plants regularly, etc. So that's going to explode. And I think IFRA and RIFM have to have another system because they won't be able to cope if they still want to manage the whole world. If they don't want countries to have their own organizations. So uh, things for this was to mention about the labeling. You see here, take, talking from uh, winemaking, uh, all the zoo bottles have the vintage of the oil, not of the solution of the oil. There is also some other labeling. And here, something that we should be prepared, uh, as I mentioned, new ingredients, uh, these tuberos, the tuberos is the same family as the agave plant. And it's, exa it's a tiny agave plant. And if you think about it, it's, it's the same shape and the same hemp, floral hemp. And um, so I dissolve this fragrance in alcohol and tequila. And uh, I've dissolved sometimes fragrances in alcohol and crystal champagne in alcohol and, and yellow plum. And so we have, it's very easy to check the safety because it's basically alcohol, water, and then a few little ester and this and that. There's no methyl eugenol, but there's going to be much more crossover. I know now a very famous brand in France called uh, Theoria of uh, liqueurs. She trained actually with me in perfumery and in Isipka in cosmetic and aromas, aromas. And so she creates flavor formulas more like a perfumer. And we started to mix her liqueurs with some fragrances when we do certain events. So just to say, this is going to be much more mixed. I know Heston, because I worked with him a lot, uh, uh, looks at this also regularly. So we are going to learn much, much more some things from the chefs, for instance, the art of uh, aging, which in perfumery we have no clue about, and uh, or very little clue, especially nowadays, and uh, the, art, the art of cooking, uh, I mean, heating, and they will learn from us the art of manipulating many more ingredients. When I see a recipe with three spices, or five spices, big deal. For me, a lot of the cooking stuff is boring, I have to say, as a perfumer. And uh, the texture is fascinating, but the, 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 the ingredients and the construction, they could do much, much more. So that's going to change too. So voila, so this, I just want to mention also uh, something about the diversity and encouraging everybody to uh, do some actions uh, about that. We, we are not used to that. We are used to that about, uh, from the farmer side, but not from the consumer side and the creative side. So this we'll see also next time. Next time, we, so a lot of actions there and the industry is uh, preparing that. So between this one and the next one, I just want to mention thanks also to the niche brands, less conventional, the concepts are also going to be very different. So whether it's diversity and the dialogue between uh, the genders, so this is already uh, developing, but also the types of talk we are going to have like uh, in perfumery and the type of activity, which will be much more uh, out there. We don't have the hard work of fragrances. We don't have the hip hop method of fragrances. And so the last slide now just as a nice little thing to talk about education and exciting people from an early age and use this kind of thing to teach children from a very young age and alerting them to the sense of smell. Well, so this is also going to happen um, across the world. Well, I thank you so much for this uh, short presentation and thank you to everybody for um, uh, presenting as well. It's very interesting to have a little gathering like this. Thank you so much, Christoph. It's always wonderful to hear from you and your fascinating approach to fra fragrance. We we'll also really appreciate you joining us so early from New York. So thank you to all our speakers. And now we have time just to take a couple of questions because um, we are running a little over on time. Um, I'm hoping um, the first question I'm going to put to um, Charles. Uh, we, oh, sorry, I'm <laughs> in my glasses. Also, we all perceive colors slightly differently. Will that have an impact on this cross-modal impact? Um, so while there are, I guess, individual differences, one might think about uh, color blindness as one kind of individual difference in how we perceive color. Tetrachromacy in some small number of uh, females too. Um, 
but uh, and also kind of cultural differences, I guess, in the associations with uh, uh, emotions with colours. But uh, from some of the latest work coming out, um, from Jus Maiki et al. in, in, in psychological science, I just saw uh, any time now, uh, they've been done studies across the world with you know, from 3,000 or 30,000 people in, in many, many different countries doing online testing and were able to show that in fact there was a pretty high degree of, uh, of agreement or consensuality about the emotions that people from different countries and cultures uh, attach to colour. And hence that might give you uh, grounds for hope that uh, there is sufficient uh, agreement between individuals uh, to make um, mappings kind of meaningful at scale. Thank you, Charles. Uh, and the next question is oh, for Barry. Would you recommend that we practice smelling then to improve our abilities? Absolutely, yes. I mean, there are many reasons to practice smelling. I think those people who are involved in um, professional use of smell in the food industry, in the wine industry, and obviously in perfume, they have a much more developed sense of smell. And we know it actually thickens white and gray matter in the brain. But there's another reason to keep practicing your sense of smell, and that is that we know now that smell training, smelling four distinct uh, odors or essential oils, first thing in the morning, last thing at night, helps you to remain cognitively more active in later life, and that it helps you to retain your sense of smell when, like all the other senses, they start to fade. Your eyesight fades, of course, as you get older, your hearing, so will your sense of smell. But smell training, shows that it really helps to uh, keep it longer. So it's a use it or lose it sense. And even for people recovering from COVID who've lost the sense of smell, we know that exposure to odor sources stimuli help to activate the regrowing receptors and, and actually help to uh, reestablish the connections with the brain. So please do smell training. It's very good for us. Okay. Okay, thank you. And the last question is for Christoph. How long do you think it will take before scent is routinely used in gaming and cinematic environments? I thought already we would see that by now. I thought 10 years ago when I did, uh, when the movie came out, Perfume or the Story of a Murderer, we did a few trials. Then in 2009, I had this technology that we have to miniaturize and we are still not there, so I don't know what to say. Now with this new VR device that we're developing, um, I hope it's uh, just a few years away now. I hope we don't have to wait another 10 years, uh, but I don't want to say anything because fragrance and innovation is a nightmare. So the investors, they don't react like they would invest in computer science because they don't even know olfaction and, and then well, it's, everything is new even. <laughs> so it's it's, well, that's my answer. Okay, thank you, Christoph. I'm very aware of the time, so I think we're going to um, finish it there. Thank you again to all our speakers today, and I hope you have found the event interesting. We hope you're suitably intrigued by our new publication. I have a copy here. Um, as you heard from Lizzie, the book pulls together a diverse range of speakers on fascinating topics, and we hope you enjoy reading it. Thanks to all for joining us, and a follow-up email will give details of where to order your copy of the book. There is also a link available on our website, www.ifreuk.org. And one last remember to mem reminder to members to join us for the AGM later today. Thanks again um, to the speakers. It's been really fascinated, fascinating. Thanks again and take care all.